Previewing week eight of college football right here at the Boys of College Football. Time to check in with Bill Bender of the Sporting News. We appreciate Bill stopping by and always enjoy the conversation. Bill, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Well, we saw one of these games of the century in Austin Stadium last weekend, and we will see another one this Saturday, of course, in uh, Austin, Texas. But uh, specifically with Ohio State, when a team loses a major game like this, this is the way I frame it from a big picture standpoint. Obviously, they have issues to clean up secondary and otherwise. No, no doubt. This is a flawed football team to an extent. But how many people picked any team to go undefeated? You know, people within the media, people that should know what they're what they're talking about and analyzing, typically pick the best teams to go 11 and one. Just the odds say you're going to trip up at some point 11 and one. What was the game that was most likely a loss for Ohio State? I know, at least in my camp, I produced a video, gave percentage totals and probabilities, and Oregon was right at the top. So if you would have told somebody back in any time during the offseason, Ohio State's going to go 11-1, and one, or they're going to have one loss, they're going to lose to Oregon 32-31, they're going to be in field goal range to win the game, the thought would be, okay, no big deal. Uh, but maybe the emotion of the immediacy is I, I'm hearing – you know, this is a flawed team. They're overrated. They're not as good as we thought they were and all of that. What? How would you review Ohio State's performance? Well, you said it. I mean, these are the, the math has changed on when you lose a game like this now because you, you can look at it like we have an out. We, we lost a game, but it's 12-team playoff. We can probably afford a mulligan. That's what I always call it, a mulligan like you have in golf. And – you know, there are some real concerns. You know, the secondary you mentioned giving up eight plays of 20 yards or more, allowing Dylan Gabriel to be comfortable during the game. But big picture, I'm starting to believe you that I don't know that there'll be an undefeated team in the Power Four. I don't, I would confine that at least. I don't know that there'll be an unbeaten Big Ten or SEC team. Though Oregon, if you look at their schedule, they've got a pretty clean look to Indianapolis where they should be favored in every game moving forward. I guess the Michigan game could be a trap game for them in some ways with the cross-country flight. That's the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, too, is this cross-country impact on the Big Ten is very real. When uh, you know you have the two time zone rule and only the home team has only lost three games, that's a big deal. It's a big deal, and I believe the loss total stands at around 10. I know I was tracking it before last weekend. Of course, we had the Penn State win and the Minnesota wins, but if you look at those versus the evaluations of those teams, for Penn State to be pushed to overtime by USC on the road maybe speaks to uh, that uh, factor even as much as a loss would, and with Minnesota – I think at this point in the season, it's been proven that they're a decent team and decidedly better than UCLA, and they're pushed to the last 20 seconds of the game at the Rose Bowl. Those almost confirm that narrative even more. Oh, I agree. And, you know, for Penn, as much as Ohio State and Oregon is the topic of conversation, I, I think there's two ways to look at that game. The one would be Ohio State had a chance to win in the final minute, mismanaged the game, ending drive in some ways and also there were some questionable calls by the refs the play callers there's just a lot of questions after the final couple minutes of that game um, especially with the 12-man rule and offensive pass interference call that it was offensive pass interference in my opinion I just don't know how often they call that in that situation um, with, with Jeremiah Smith trying to get separation and Will Howard sliding I saw people kind of, I was making as a pruder comparison that, you know, was there one second left? Was there not? Did they get the timeout? Who cares? They lost the game. Um, took away from what Penn State did. Penn State was impressive on the road to come back from 20 to six with all those cross country things we talked about. Tyler Warren was unguardable. And I think that was just a loud a statement to me that, that James Franklin won a big game on the road and kind of buried USC in the Big Ten race. Yes. Uh People are out for Lincoln Riley at this point, and I get it. When you shake it all out, it's just all about wins and losses. However, this team is right there against good opponents. So 
of course, the standard at USC is to win the games, not just look good or be close. But it's a third year for Lincoln Riley. I, I don't think he's anywhere close to a hot seat. I don't think USC approaches things like that. There's a money factor, of course. And where do you go that's better than Lincoln Riley? But I, I see, and people need to separate, of course, what's talked about on social media versus what the actual decision makers are 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 doing and saying. Right. Yeah. I mean, and they've lost close games and they're going to have to adjust. You see this in conferences all the time. Look at the record of, I got to get these teams right, BYU, Houston, I might need help, UCF and Cincinnati. If you look at how much they struggled in the Big 12 last year, it's that first year in a new conference. You're going to unfamiliar settings. Um, and then this year, Cincinnati's better. UCF's been up and down. Houston has a coaching change, so they're getting through that. And BYU's undefeated. So I do think there is that year of getting used to it. Um, maybe that's a bad example in the SEC, but Texas is different in my opinion because they're just really good. They have enough talent that they're really good. But, you know, if when we talk next week, what are we going to talk about if Georgia beats Texas? Not ready for the SEC, not ready for the trenches, those kind of things. But I think for USC, there is a very real issue up front on both sides that, you know, in these games, Michigan was pushing them around. Wisconsin pushed them around for a half. They actually did better on the run against Penn State. They just couldn't stop Tyler Warren. That was one of the most remarkable performances of the season by the Penn State tight end. It really is. And it makes me think of Brock Bowers because I always thought, how could you run an offense through a tight end? How could the tight end, for as important as they are as a security blanket for the quarterback, uh, doesn't seem very productive or explosive for a tight end to be your main weapon on offense. But of course, Georgia disproved that with uh, Brock Bowers, who I thought was a generational talent. And I'm not comparing the two athletically or from an NFL prospectus standpoint, because I don't know what the thought is about Tyler Warren, but the performance that he turned in from a statistic standpoint was, of course, way past anything Brock Bowers uh, put on a stat sheet, but uh, yeah, Penn State's best player on offense is turning into a tight end, and and people that have followed the Big Ten have known about him for quite some time. For sure, and mismatch, I made a comparison all week to Mark Bavaro. That's a dated reference, I understand, but the old Notre Dame tight end that played for the Giants, he kind of, that's what I'm seeing, this guy that just can shield defenders, make the big catch, gets down the field. Um Everybody gets compared to Gronkowski and, and Kelsey these days. I actually think the Texas tight end, Gunnar Helm, is a little bit like Kelsey. So it's cool to see good tight ends in the game. And, and again, big picture, Penn State now with an opportunity on November 2nd to play Ohio State at home. They haven't beat the Buckeyes since 2016. That's well documented. Um, and then you look at a situation where if Penn State wins that game, it's probably going to be Penn State and Oregon in the Big Ten Championship. And then Ohio State's sitting there in the third seed with a high-pressure game against Indiana, who has a huge game this weekend against Nebraska. I mean, of all the Big Ten games this weekend, that's the one that you have to watch because the winner of that game is probably sitting in that fourth spot if the Big Ten is trying to get four playoff bids. Bill Bender joining us from Sporting News. Um, Bill has uh, a number of uh, pieces coming out to this week. Preseason All-America team. Um, from you and also um, a, a selection involving Red Grange. If uh, folks, if you're unaware, uh, it's the 100th anniversary of, you know, I've seen this in, uh, several times, but I didn't know what exactly it was. The, was it his galloping ghost uh, famed game against Michigan? Is that the 100 year anniversary or just the beginning of his career? Yeah, it's the 100th anniversary of the Michigan game, which was, I've read a book um, by Doug Villard about red grange uh, the golden age of red and it's so fascinating like if you look and you, if you if you're a college football nerd like i am you look back 100 years at this michigan game and i think the most fascinating thing about the game itself was this uh fielding yost at the time michigan's a dominant program coaches at the time had the option of so they run, they kicked the ball off to start the game red grange runs it back the coaches at the time had the option of either receiving or kicking after the opposing team scored a touchdown. So so basically, Michigan could say, we'll take the ball, or they kicked off again. 
because at the time it was a field position game. There wasn't a lot of touchdowns. Well, Red Grange scored four touchdowns in 12 minutes. And the comparison Doug gave me would be like, it would be like a baseball player hitting four straight grand slams. Like that's what the the comparison to the time was. And just his celebrity and what he meant to college football, getting the NFL started. There's a lot there that maybe gets lost a couple of generations because even when I was growing up, it was, oh, Red Grange. Yeah, that guy was a stud. But you didn't really know, you know, you just kind of look at it as leather helmet football. It's a really fascinating story. It was fun to dig into. And, you know, Illinois obviously takes that seriously. I had had that circled in July that that's a tricky spot for Michigan anyway, before their quarterback struggles and everything they're going through. So I think they're stepping into one there. Yeah, I guess we'll dive a little bit deeper into this matchup. Uh, Illinois, whether they were, quote unquote, looking ahead or whatever the situation, they ran into a freshman quarterback and Ryan Brown at Purdue, who suddenly has, I I have yet to see him play. Um, I think people can forgive me for Purdue, uh, you know, some somewhat descending on my list of priorities every Saturday that I have yet to see that. But I did check in very late in that game because I wanted to see this monumental upset and comeback by Purdue if they were able to pull it off. So I saw the last couple plays and some of overtime, but they've got this quarterback who's now throwing for 300 yards and rushing for 100 against Illinois. Uh, I had a little bit more faith in Brett Bielema's defense prior to um, Saturday. It may be a one-off. It may be just a bad matchup that they got into one of those kind of games, but they were able to survive and now take on Michigan. And uh, these are, are two fairly, although the Luke Altmeyer factor means that Illinois has a distinct advantage in the passing game, you would think. And uh, Michigan is still trying to figure out uh, who's going to play quarterback. I don't know. Uh, I did not see Sharon Moore's uh, news conference this week, whether he announced a starter. No, and I I didn't even look at that either. So I'm going to cheat and try to see now if there's anything. But um, oh, it might it might be I don't know. Yeah, you just <laughs> it's it's very cloudy. So I, I think you could see Orgy, you could see Tuttle. Um, they've tried everything. They just don't have an answer at quarterback this year. And you know, rather that means that Jaden Davis gets the keys at some point. A freshman, mm. we'll see. Um. They will face a challenge with Luke Altmeyer. He's only thrown one interception. He's been really good, um, efficient in Illinois' offense. They are at home. And I would this would be a no-brainer Illinois pick for me, if not for the second half of that Purdue game, where they gave up 40 points and a half. And you know Michigan's going to want to run the football, and Donovan Edwards and Khalil Mullins. Khalil Mullins is one of the best running backs in the country. So – I, it's just going to be a tight game. I think it's going to be a tight, fun, exciting game and probably a field goal either way. And Michigan games have been very, really tough for me to pick this year because I think I picked them to lose against USC. They won. I picked them to win against Washington. They lost. Um, everything in between, I can't figure them out. So I, I would anticipate whatever I picked. I picked Michigan to win by a field goal, so you might want to go the other way. I'm now reviewing my Michigan picks. I did pick them to lose to Texas. I did pick them to beat USC, but I also picked them to beat Washington. So I've, I've stumbled a couple of times or at least once on my Michigan picks. We got Bill Bender here. Oh, real quick, News. Jack Tuttle is starting. Okay. So um, and they're calling him Uncle Jack Tuttle. So I, I that's probably the right move. He seems to be the most functional in the passing game. Then you can mix in Orgy on some runs. I mean, if I was, if I was Michigan, I might put our Orgy at slot receiver. Because they have a serious problem at receiver. They did that in inverse, uh, uh, what, about 12 years ago with Devin Gardner. Right. Where I was pretty remarkable. I thought it was pretty remarkable at the time that I'm watching this Michigan receiver transition to a quarterback right in the middle of the season. And he was pretty good. I was like, wow, that's that's pretty impressive. Yeah, Gardner. And then they did the same with Denard Robinson when they probably moved him to running back late. He probably should have just been playing running back or slot receiver early. And, uh, you know, one of their most dynamic talents in program history. So, yeah, it just it adds up to what should be a pretty exciting game between those two. And it follows the Indiana game where, you know, Big Noon's there, I believe. And the Hoosiers have a chance to sprint out to 7-0 and with that offense around Kurt Signetti, which brings me to another point, Mark. 
it's going to be interesting to see how the Hoosiers balance being in the playoff mix versus every Power 5 opening wanting or Power 4 opening wanting Kirk Signetti, right? Like Florida would be a place that you would watch as we get down the stretch. And is he going to leave? And I've, I've been curious about that from the jump is how do these programs that are in a playoff race to handle their coaches? You know, Lane Kiffin's another example. He comes up every year. Well, Ole Miss has two loss now. You know, do, do, do these coaches leave in the middle of the season? It's not out. Of, I don't think it can happen, but it's not out of the question. Yeah, we've seen all sorts of things in college football over the last three years that we would have not predicted. So I'm right there with you. And of course, with a 14 playoff, I'm trying to think there was one or two incidents similar to that. But of course, you've got the limited field, so it's unlikely to happen, um, much less so than it is now. So, yeah. That's an interesting factor. And you brought up Indiana, Nebraska as possibly the game of the week in the Big Ten. This is, to me, one of those testing ground games. Okay, we know Nebraska's improved. We know Indiana's substantially improved. But now they're going to face someone at their own level or their new their new level for Indiana. This is their new level. They've now been able to pass Michigan State and Maryland a couple of teams that are typically in front of them uh, with wins. And so now where do they stand against Nebraska? Nebraska defense versus Indiana offense. I was checking out Curtis Rourke's numbers. They're uh, good, right? Oh, no, they're really good. <laughs> 74%. And uh, 14 to 2, I think, is the TD to pick ratio versus Dylan Riola. Great talent. I'm sure that he's going to have a tremendous career at Nebraska. I, I believe so. But to date, he's faced an Illinois team that was his first testing ground, didn't play well in the fourth quarter or overtime, and then struggled against Rutgers on a 13 for 27. So we know Nebraska's defense is good, but Indiana is going to score points. So they're going to need something you would think out of Riola to keep up with that Indiana offense. Yeah. And I'm curious to see another one score game. Nebraska won one of those a couple of weeks ago. And it is a contrast in styles, Nebraska. How good is your defense? And Indiana was impressed with how they beat Northwestern. They pulled away in the second half, and this is the best defense they've seen to this point. You know, Nebraska's pretty good on defense. So um, it seems like each game that Indiana can win, we're going to believe a little more. At least I feel that way. Watching them beat Northwestern, I know that might not do it for some people, but Northwestern pretty decent on defense most of the time. And Nebraska is a little bit better. It's a huge spot in Bloomington. Uh, Indiana's also got a running game. You know, they got two running backs behind Ellison's great uh, behind Rourke. So this offense is real. And it feels a little bit like James Madison in crimson uniforms last year. James Madison was that team before they lost. And they, they took that all the way into November. So they absolutely are in the factor in this race. And Nebraska can... Man, what a two-week stretch for them. They beat Indiana. They go into the shoe, get a chance to prove it against Ohio State. So we're going to learn all we need to learn about Dylan Rayola, that Nebraska defense, and whether or not Matt Rule. I do think he has them. Like They're 5-1, and one, so they're one game away from bowl eligibility, which is a step for them considering they haven't been in a bowl game since 2016.